and if you cannot hear my voice clearly. The listening section has 42 questions. Follow along as you listen to the directions to the listening section. Directions. In this section of the test, you will hear a teacher or other school staff member talking to students. Each talk is followed by one question. Choose the best answer to each question and mark the letter of the correct answer on your answer sheet. You will hear each talk only one time. Here is an example. Listen to a teacher speaking to a class. Today we have a new student joining our class. Her name is Sarita, and she just moved here with her family. I'd like you to all make Sarita feel welcome by showing her around the school and explaining how to find the gym and library. Remember that she doesn't know anyone here so please be friendly. What does the teacher want the students to do? Now read the answer choices. The correct answer is A. Help a new classmate. Here is another example. Listen to a music teacher talking to a class. The next song I will play will feature some very interesting instruments. I'll turn up the volume a little bit so you can hear these instruments in the background. So sit back and enjoy the music. When this piece is over, we'll have a discussion about it. What will the students probably do next? Now read the answer choices. Như vậy là chúng ta vừa nghe hai ví dụ đúng chưa? Đó là hai ví dụ. Và bây giờ thì bây giờ thì các em sẽ nghe từ câu 1 nha. Listen to some music. Okay, the right answer is B. Go on to the next page and the test will begin with question number 1. Nào, bây giờ các em làm bài thực sự nào. Tích vào các ô ở trong phiếu trả bài. Làm bài nha. Number 1. Listen to a school principal talking to a group of students. I was very pleased by your band's performance at the holiday festival. I don't often see students playing their own music. Student bands usually play something traditional. But you actually composed something original. That's really impressive. What did the principal like best about the band? Number two, listen to a science teacher talking to her students. First, we are going to collect some leaves that have fallen from the trees. Then, we will compare the colors of those leaves. After that, we will use the leaves to make a poster about what happens to trees during autumn. Okay, now put on your jackets and let's head outside. What will the class probably do next? Number three. Listen to an art teacher talking to a class. Today we're going to begin our lesson on sculptures. Because we are going to work with clay and it can get pretty messy, I'm going to stop you all about 10 minutes before class ends. Then you can start cleaning up your workstations and put away your supplies. What is the purpose of the talk? Number four. Listen to a teacher talking to a history class. When we take our class trip into the city this week, we'll be driving through a tunnel 
that will take us under a river. It's so easy to take a train or car into the city today by using one of the tunnels that we don't think much about the fact that we're crossing a river. But in the city's early days, the only way to get to the city was by boat. I want you to keep this in mind as we learn more about the city's history. What is the teacher explaining? Number five, listen to a teacher talking to his class. As you know, tomorrow we'll be planting trees in the park. A few dozen saplings will be provided, and you'll be given gardening tools to dig holes for the trees. One important thing to remember, gardening involves working with dirt, so don't come to school in nice clothes. Make sure to dress in something old, something you wouldn't mind getting dirty. What does the teacher tell the students to do? Number six. Listen to a school principal speaking over the intercom. Next Friday is the annual school dance. Tickets go on sale starting today in the school cafeteria during lunch. They will be on sale all week. Make sure you buy a ticket in advance, as we won't be selling them at the door the night of the dance. We only have 150 tickets to sell, and they usually sell out before the day of the dance. You don't want to miss this special event. What is probably true about the dance? Number seven. Listen to a geography teacher talking in a classroom. Now we're going to watch a documentary program about one of the countries we've been discussing in class. But I'm afraid it's a little too bright in here. Could someone please draw the curtains while I turn on the TV? Then there won't be any glare on the screen, and everyone will be able to see just fine. What does the teacher ask? Number eight. Listen to a history teacher speaking to his class. In order to understand a little more about the life of United States President Abraham Lincoln, we are going to watch a short video. I want you to take notes during the video and think about what we have learned so far. Afterward, we will have a discussion about Lincoln's life. What will the students probably do next? Number nine. Listen to an English teacher speaking to her class. Before we start writing our stories, I want to show some ways you can make your characters more believable. You can try to give them real life details. One thing you might want to do is base your characters on people you know in real life. This is something that even many famous writers do. What is the purpose of the talk? Number 10. Listen to a teacher talking in a history class. Throughout history, people all around the world have invented many different writing systems. One interesting alphabet is the so-called Futhark, which was used in Norway a thousand years ago. Futhark is an exceptional system because it is the shortest known alphabet in the world. It only had 16 letters. While some writing systems, like Chinese, can have many thousands of symbols, Futhark made do with just 16 characters. 
What point does the speaker make about the alphabet in ancient Norway? Go on to the next page. Now you will hear some conversations. Each conversation is followed by three or more questions. Choose the best answer to each question and mark the letter of the correct answer on your answer sheet. You will hear each conversation only one time. Questions 11 through 13. Listen to a conversation between two students at school. Hi, Tommy. Are you on your way to the cafeteria? No. I was on my way to the library to return a book, but now I'm looking for my watch. It must have fallen off somewhere here in the grass. It was a gift from my father, so I really want to find it. Hmm. I'd like to help you look for it, but I'm heading to the art building. I made an appointment with my art teacher to talk about a homework assignment, and I don't want to keep him waiting. That's okay. The watch has got to be here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Hey, by the way, do you want to study for tomorrow's history test with me and some other people from our class after school? We haven't decided where we're going to meet yet, probably at the city library. That sounds like a good idea. I'd like to join you. I'm having lunch with the others. So we'll know where we're meeting by the time I see you in science class. All right, I'll see you then. Now, answer the questions. Number 11. Where is the conversation probably taking place? Number 12. What did the boy lose? Number 13. According to the conversation, what has not been decided yet? Questions 14 through 17. Listen to a conversation between two friends in a school cafeteria. Look, the cafeteria is almost empty. We won't have to wait in line too long. Good idea. Let's get something now before it gets too crowded. Hmm, I think I'll have one of the salads today and something to drink. But I can't make up my mind which drink to choose. It's hard to pick something when there are so many different kinds to choose from. It's better to have too many choices than not enough. Why don't you have something you've never tried before? Maybe you can discover something new that you like. That's a really good idea. And what about you? Are you going to have a salad too? I think so. And maybe a bottle of juice. And a cup of that soup too. It looks really good. But I'll definitely pass on the dessert items. I've been eating way too many sweet things lately. Now answer the questions. Number 14. What are the speakers happy to see when they enter the cafeteria? Number 15. What do the speakers say about the drinks in the cafeteria? Number 16. What does the boy suggest the girl do? Number 17. What will the boy not order for lunch?
Questions 18 through 21. Listen to a conversation between two students at school. Excuse me, is this the way to the gym? Uh, yes, it is. Are you a new student here? Yes. I'm trying to find the meeting about the dance team. I heard that the school is starting one up. I wanted to find out more about it. Do you dance? Uh-huh. I've been taking lessons since I was little. Traditional dance, ballet, jazz. Wow, then you must be pretty good. Anyway, I heard about that new dance team. I think they're going to be performing at school assemblies and stuff like that. Well, the gym's that way, but I just came from there, and I heard someone saying that the dance team was meeting in the music room. Are you sure? Because the notice I saw said the gymnasium. Well, remember that big storm we had a couple of days ago? And all that rain? Yes. Well, some water got into the gym through the roof, so they're doing some work in there. You know, fixing the roof. Do you know where the music room is? Near the library? Yes, I had my first music class today, actually. Oh, good. Now I just have to find Mr. Harris, my gym teacher. Oh, I wish I could help you. That's okay. I just have to return a basketball I borrowed. But I think I'll just leave it for him at the main office. Good luck with the dancing. Thanks. Now, answer the questions. Number 18. What is the girl on her way to do? Number 19. What does the girl say about her experience with dancing? Number 20. What happened because of a rainstorm? Number 21. What does the boy say he needs to do? Questions 22 through 25. Listen to a conversation between two friends from school. Maria, would you like to be on my team in next week's trivia quiz? Trivia quiz? I've heard about it, but I don't know exactly what it is. It's a general knowledge contest. All of the teams are given a set of questions to answer. Questions on all kinds of topics. And the team that gets the most correct answers wins. Sure, I guess I could play. But why do you want me on your team? Well, our team already has students who are interested in biology, history, and math. But we're not too good at geography. A lot of questions are about various countries, continents, and things like that. We need someone strong in geography, like you. Well, geography is my favorite subject. You can count me in. Should I study for this? Hmm. It's hard to study for this kind of competition. But if you want, I have examples of questions that were asked in the quizzes in the past. A list like that would give you a general idea of what to expect. That would be great. So will it be held in the library? Play this time, so they had to move it to a place with more space. Even the cafeteria wasn't big enough. Wow, the gym is pretty big. Well, that just shows you how popular the trivia quiz has become. Now, answer the questions. Number 22. What does the boy ask the girl to do? Number 23. What subject is the girl interested in? Number 24. What does the boy offer to give the girl?
Number 25. Where will the event be held this year? Go on to the next page. Kéo nghe lại đoạn này chút nhá. Number 23. What subject is the girl interested in? Number 24. What does the boy offer to give the girl? Number 25. Where will the event be held this year? to the next page. Now you will hear some talks and discussions about academic topics. Each talk or discussion is followed by four or more questions. Choose the best answer to each question and mark the letter of the correct answer on your answer sheet. You will hear each talk or discussion only one time. Questions 26 through 29. Listen to a teacher talking in a history class. When people think of life in Europe hundreds of years ago, they often think of castles built of stone with huge towers. Castles were the homes of kings and queens and other powerful people. Hundreds of relatives, soldiers, and workers also lived there. The kitchen was a very important place in a castle. It was busy all day and every day. A castle's kitchen was usually located a good distance away from other castle rooms and buildings, especially the Great Hall, a large room where people gathered for meals and other activities. This was because of the danger of fires. The kitchen staff needed to use fire for cooking, but sometimes kitchen fires accidentally grew out of control and could spread to other parts of the castle. That's why the kitchen was usually far away. Each kitchen also had a garden where vegetables were grown. Back then, food could not be frozen or kept in refrigerators like today. Some vegetables could be stored underground, but not for long. So most vegetables were picked fresh from the castle garden as they were needed. But of course, a king's dinner consisted of many other ingredients like bread, meat, and fish. To prepare a full meal, many cooks were needed. The castle kitchen employed a whole team of people, some of whom made bread and others who prepared desserts or cooked meat dishes. The chef was like a head manager who was responsible for making sure that the team of assistants did their job right. Although chefs would also be involved in the cooking of some parts of the meal, their main task was to supervise the whole team. Now answer the questions. Number 26. What is the main topic of the talk? Number 27. What was important about the location of a castle's kitchen? Number 28. What does the teacher say about vegetables? Number 29.
According to the teacher, what was the chef's main responsibility? Questions 30 through 33. Now you will hear part of a radio program. Hello listeners, today I'll be speaking with Ms. Amanda Jones, the town director of road transportation. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Ms. Jones, it seems like there are always new roads to build or old ones to fix. Let's start with new roads. How do you decide where to put in a new road? Well, that's an interesting question. One way to think about it is to go back in history. You know, people didn't build the first roads. Animals did. These roads were really just tracks, just paths that animals made in the dirt as they walked to find food or water. Then people started to use them. In fact, some of the roads we drive on today were at one time paths made by wild animals. But we humans began making roads for ourselves at some point, right? Yes, of course. We made them when we needed them, which happened when we started to settle in communities and we wanted to trade with people in other communities. Even then, the roads were pretty simple. Let me ask a question. Why would we need anything more, like paved roads? Well, I suppose when we wanted to carry things, when we built vehicles, like carts and wagons. Exactly. And that's when you start to see better roads. Roads made with logs, or better yet, stone or brick. And roads made with good drainage. A good road has to have a place for water to go. Rainwater can really damage a road, or even wash it away. In England thousands of years ago, people made roads on ridges, along the cliffs and hills beside streams and rivers. Why? because it's drier there. Ridgeways, they called them. Some ridgeways still exist in England. They're still used today for walking and hiking. Now, road building really started to increase when nations began to grow. In ancient India, rulers created big road networks. It helped them to control a lot of land from central cities. And the Romans became excellent road builders. After all, they had a huge empire to connect together. But the roads in ancient Greece were not as good as those of the Romans. They didn't put as much effort into road building. Why? Because Greece is full of islands, and they traveled more by boat. Now answer the questions. Number 30. What are the speakers mainly talking about? Number 31. Why does the woman talk about animals? Number 32. Why did the people in England build ridgeways? Number 33. What does the woman say about roads in ancient Greece? Go on to the next page. Questions 34 through 38. Now you will hear a speaker talking to a class on a trip to a marine aquarium. Hello everyone. Thank you for visiting the aquarium today. I hope you've enjoyed seeing the thousands of fish we have here, as well as the other sea animals. During the next hour, we're going to show you some more sea creatures. They all come from a body of water called the Sargasso Sea. The Sargasso Sea is actually part of the Atlantic Ocean. What I mean is, 
It isn't a separate body of water. It's more like a sea within an ocean. It's located off the southern half of North America, and it is very large. It covers millions of kilometers. Now, a couple of things make it distinctive. First, and probably most important, the waters there are very calm, calm and warm. There's also very little wind there. Surrounding the Sargasso Sea are water currents in the Atlantic that move in a circular motion counterclockwise. This water swirls around the Sargasso Sea. Because of the way these currents move, the water in the middle of the Sargasso Sea doesn't move much at all. Because of the still waters and the lack of wind, sailing ships crossing the Atlantic travel much more slowly when they get to the Sargasso Sea. Without wind, sailboats can get stuck there for long periods. Something else that's unusual about the Sargasso Sea is the seaweed floating on its surface. Large amounts of a kind of seaweed called sargassum float on top of the water there. And because of the currents, the seaweed stays in the Sargasso Sea. It's kind of held in place by the rotating currents. Now, this seaweed is what interests us most here at the aquarium because it supports all kinds of sea life, like shrimp, crabs, and fish. Sargassum creates an ecosystem for them to live in. What makes this ecosystem quite remarkable is that the creatures there are ones you'd expect to find much closer to shore, much closer to land, not out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Most likely, sargassum probably did not exist in the Sargasso originally. Rather, the seaweed and some of the ecosystem it supported drifted out into the Sargasso Sea long ago and became trapped there by the currents. From there, it simply spread all over the Sargasso Sea. Now, answer the questions. Number 34. What is the speaker mainly talking about? Number 35. According to the speaker, what do certain currents in the Atlantic Ocean do? Number 36. What is the speaker explaining when he mentions sailing ships? Number 37. What is sargassum? Number 38. According to the speaker, what is surprising about some animal species that live in the Sargasso Sea? Questions 39 through 42. Listen to part of a discussion in a science class. Since you all seemed to like our discussion last week, I thought we'd continue talking about unusual animals. Have any of you ever heard of an animal called the narwhal? No, but wall sounds kind of like whale. Is a narwhal a kind of whale? In fact, it is. The narwhal is a species of whale that lives in the cold waters of the Arctic Ocean. Now, both male and female narwhals have teeth, but the male's teeth look very strange. This is because the male narwhal has one long straight tooth. 
How long? It's about seven to ten feet long. That's longer than the height of the tallest person in the world. Since this one tooth is so long and pointy, a lot of people say it looks like the horn of a unicorn. In fact, sailors in the old days used to call the narwhal the unicorn of the sea. Some people even thought that it had magical powers. Why did they think it was magical? Because of the big tooth? Precisely. Hundreds of years ago, in the Middle Ages, Europeans thought that unicorn horns could cure people who were sick. Because the narwhal's tooth looks like a unicorn's horn, some people thought it could be used to cure sick people. As a result, narwhal teeth were considered quite valuable, and they were sold by merchants for a lot of money. So why do narwhals have this long tooth? Do they use it to protect themselves? Well, we're not sure, but a lot of scientists agree that male narwhals probably use it to attract female mates, the way a male peacock uses his beautiful feathers to attract a mate. The female narwhal will choose the male with the longest tooth, the same way that the female peacock chooses the male with the most beautiful feathers. Now answer the questions. Number thirty-nine. What is the main topic of the talk? Number forty. Why does the teacher mention unicorns? Number forty one. Why did people in Europe hundreds of years ago think the narwhal was special? Number forty two. Why does the teacher mention peacocks? Stop. This is the end of the listening section.